so considering all the finding that went on in this movie, can we com- can we consider this the best found footage movie of the year? <laughs> Welcome to the Crooked Table Podcast. This is Rob. And this is Kai. So we're back after an extended absence. Um, I guess you could say we've been sort of in a transitional period. Does that sound about right? Um, yes. Crooked Table. Yes. But what is the transition to Crooked Table? Not really. I don't know. Some Actually having some form of consistency with posting. That's true. Yeah. And after, yeah. So after three months of deliberation, we're going to try to... Well, I'm going to try to post an episode once a week, probably on Wednesdays, and that could include me and Kai, that could include me and Freddie, that could include me and somebody else, that could include just me Ooh, talking about I stuff. Want, I want that, that was one. Well, apparently that Fantastic Four episode I did last year that had some pretty decent downloads uh, comparatively, and that was just 35 minutes of being, me being like, Fantastic Four, what happened? <laughs> I know, and that was that was really almost a year ago now. Yeah, I mean, I, I give me, you know, you know me. I'm there's It's not any challenge for me to yammer on about movies for forty minutes or anything. So um, this week we're going to be talking about Finding Dory and the success surrounding that, and our thoughts on Pixar and Finding Nemo and all that in general. Next week I'm going to be doing sort of a catch up um, episode, kind of dropping my quick thoughts on a bunch of movies that I've seen recently, some of my favorites. And as well as, you know, kind of touching base on um, some of my favorite movies of the year thus far. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. You going to listen to that one or? I'll try. Okay, I, good. I will. Good. I just get so busy listening to music on my computer that I forget about the podcast. Don't you know podcasts are where it's at? Haven't you heard of Serial? The podcast Serial? Oh, yeah. I think I have heard of that one. Yeah. That's, well, that one of the, like, major podcast uh, shows that's really making the art form making the medium sort of mainstream well you should feel special because your podcast is the only podcast i listen to i know i do all feel over special. the net oh uh, thank you honey so first of all i guess it's, you know let's talk about kind of what we've seen recently i've seen a lot more than you have but what what are you like what are you obsessed with at the moment as far as watching stuff well i know this is a couple years old at this point but um back um a year and a half ago or so rob and i started watching cosmos and then we stopped watching it because it was a little boring, uh, mostly for Rob, than for me. It wasn't that it was boring. It's that he's his voice is his voice is very relaxing, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it it makes it it's very soothing. So you know he's like, let's board the ship of the imagination. And I'm like, okay, and I have a blanket. I'm sitting on the sofa, and I'm all you know. It's it, circumstances are right for that to happen. That's true. That's true. And so lately, I've been watching Cosmos again, um, just to pick up where. Rob and I left off. So I've been watching those a little bit before I go to sleep, which actually works out yeah, since see, his voice exactly. is so soothing. That's what I'm saying. And some that, episodes are better than others. Is that a good thing or a bad thing that you watch it right before you go to sleep because it helps you relax and go to sleep? Isn't it supposed to stimulate your brain cells and get, make you like, science is awesome? It depends Tell on the episode, them. really. Um, there's some episodes that are more uh, not as uh, interesting to me as others. So, but yeah, I'm getting back into Cosmos, into a two-year-old show. I wonder why, though, it hasn't been um, renewed for another season. I think it was more, I think they, they did it more as a mini series type of deal than as an actual, like, ongoing series. Neil deGrasse Tyson's got, like, a bazillion things going on, and I don't know what kind of ratings that pulled for Fox. I think they aired on Fox, didn't it? I'm pretty sure, did. yeah. Because Seth MacFarlane was an executive producer, and he's, like, made hundreds of millions of dollars for Fox over the last decade or so. So, um, okay, so that's, that's pretty much your thing. That's been what I've specifically been watching. I'm not really, I'm not, uh, I'm not a big TV watcher. Really, the only thing that I watch on TV is is YouTube. Is like YouTube. Um, College humor. College humor. Cinema sins and watch screen Mojo. junkies. Yeah, and those are only a few. Kevin minutes Smith. Long. Kevin Smith. You don't watch Kevin Smith. I don't watch I do. Kevin Smith. Jeremy Johns, Chris Tuckman. Oh God! And you show me the, some of those. I'm like, ah. I like, Jeremy Johns. He's a little. He's very energetic. He yes. Well, he's got a million subscribers, so something's working out right. For exactly. Him. Exactly. So. But. And um, then and then we've been watching some classic movies. Yes. What we did have... we watch? How did you feel? We, we watched Rebel Without a Cause yesterday. We Neither one of us had seen it, and I know I'm a bad movie person for not having seen some of these things. But, you know, filling in some of the gaps. And I, I thought it was good. I feel like I feel like it's slightly overhyped that it made a much bigger impact in the 50s than watching it now 
really we were able to sort of glean from it. Right. Yeah. And um, and not to say that it wasn't good. James Dean. I mean, the acting from all of the all the actors was stellar. I mean, they were all Natalie Wood was great. James Dean was great. Um, Stella, which is funny because movie, that movie always makes me th- the Stella thing and the you tearing me uh, apart always remind me of each other because they're from like Street, sort of Street sort Carnage. of bad boy type actors back in the like the fifties and yeah and actually I think there was um some I read in the trivia that there was a set there was this the set for Rub Without a Cause that was also the same set as Streetcar with Name Desire yeah yeah so that weird. does work out I guess they did that a You're lot back tearing then. me apart Lisa yeah well that's a that's another terrible I know, movie. I know. Who That's... apparently was inspired by James Dean and his films. But um, actually, I wanted to see... Because uh, we have a whole list going of um, classic movies we want to watch. So we started with To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Singing in the Rain, and Rebel Without a Cause. And I actually wanted to start with East... I actually wanted to watch East of Eden first before Rebel Without a Cause. But... Because um, I've read the book. But I didn't think it made any sense to do East of Eden before Rebel Without a Cause. When Rebel Without a Cause is... The one oh, everybody knows. Yeah. The red jacket and yeah. Yes, exactly. And there and of course the Paula Abdul video, Rush Rush, was a was a play on that. Yeah, anybody under the age of thirty is like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, I am curious on who your listener demographic yeah. is. Yeah. Reach out to us at Crooked Table on Twitter and let us know if you've ever if you've never heard of the Rush Rush video by Paul Abdul, because I, I hadn't even I didn't even remember the video per se until you started to bring it up, and I was like, oh yeah, I guess I saw that. And a young Keanu Reeves was in that. Whoa, I know that was like right during the time of Bill and Ted. I guess so. Early, yeah. Late in the early nineties. Early nineties, yeah, like ninety one, ninety two. Same year as Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, I think. Oh yeah, maybe ninety one. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I've been obsessed with two things lately that I've been driving Kai nuts with. One is. Pop star, the new movie by The Lonely Island, uh, where Andy Samberg plays a you know pop singer named uh, Connor for real, and it's essentially a mockumentary making fun of the pop music lifestyle and people like Justin Bieber and that kind of fame obsession uh, culture that we live in. And I've been kind of incessantly driving her nuts with the soundtrack of uh, Finest Girl and I'm So Humble and some of the songs on there. So if you guys haven't gone to seen that. I've gone to see that. If you guys haven't gone to see that, rather, uh, see, I'm so excited about it. I can't even get my words straight. Um, and it sounds like none of you have because it's probably on its way out of theaters now. I think it's it made 4.6 million, I believe, opening weekend. And I didn't even check this weekend. It's probably out of the top 10 already. It took five. It was a budget of 5 million. No, it was a budget of like 20 million or something. Oh, geez. Or 40 million, something like that. It's oh, wow. it's, it's going to be a big flop. But it, it's that kind of film that feels like it's definitely going to develop a cult following because MacGruber, a lot of people said that made about the same amount of money as MacGruber, which is also uh, directed by um, Akiva Schaefer. Because Akiva Schaefer, one of the Lonely Island guys, co-directed Popstar with Jorma Tacone, and I'm pretty sure he, he did uh, he did uh, MacGruber as well. So they've been, uh, they've been having some issues with their filmography. And Hot Rod was another one that they did that, that had issues, so... Yeah, it's really unfortunate because Popstar is getting a very warm critical reception. Every review I've seen of it has been glowing. All the podcasts that I've heard with, you know, intellectual film criticism. And they're all saying about how great the movie was and how funny it is and all that stuff. So if you haven't gone to see Popstar and you're tired of superhero movies for a change and you need a break, um, definitely go check that out before it's gone. Uh, If not, definitely at least pick up a copy of the soundtrack and check it out on Blu-ray. So speaking of superheroes... The other thing that I've been obsessed with is I finally broke down after two years. It's funny that you were saying I know about Cosmos. I know it's a couple years old because my my thing was also going to be, well, after post-season two, I'm finally jumping aboard The Flash on CW. And uh, season one is on Netflix. And actually today, Netflix struck a deal with CW that they're going to be getting the seasons of their shows a lot faster. I think I read within two weeks after the season ends. So I hope that that's going to start kicking in ASAP and we can get season two of The Flash on there soon. Because uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to watch that before season three comes on. Um, so, but I've I've been really absorbed into that, and I bought a Flash T-shirt because I'm like I think I'm a Flash fan now, and uh, introduced my parents to it, and they were they were into it right off the bat, and and I'm a fan of Grant Gustin's from Glee, so it wasn't it wasn't a big leap for me to jump right into that show. Well, I don't know though. I rem- I recall when um, you first heard the casting news that Grant Gustin 
Sebastian from Glee was moving over to Flash. Like, oh, I don't know. I, I, I feel like with you, there was initially it was some hesitation. Well, because I didn't see part. it's a different kind of a role for him, and I'd only seen him on Glee where he played kind of a douchebag. Yeah. Um, who was basically just there to create conflict for Blaine and and Kurt. Um, but you know, so I hadn't hadn't really given thought to him seeing him as playing a superhero, but. He's really good on the show, and I'm really I'm about halfway through the season thus far. If you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen a couple tweets me being like the Flash season three, oh my god, and like kind of leaning through the leading through the episodes. And I just finished the one where Flash and Arrow faced off, so that was um, that was really fun. So anyway, I know I'm really late on that one, but if any of you guys are interested in the Flash or like been holding off, like oh, I don't know if I want to get into that. Uh, you know, don't make my mistake. Jump up, jump aboard, especially since, from what I hear, the Flash season three is going to be dealing with the Flashpoint storyline from the comic books, or at least some version of that. So it's very likely we'll have that four-way crossover between Arrow, the Flash, Supergirl, which is joining the CW this upcoming season, and Legends of Tomorrow, probably with all those characters to, to, uh, combined. And I don't know. I'm I'm not sure if they're going to be teaming up against something Avengers style, or if it's going to be just, you know, may, maybe maybe the Flashpoint thing can make, uh, kind of shift the reality of, of the shows and kind of make any changes that they feel like they need to, I guess. And this is, I'm sure this has been said before, but it seems like DC has better luck on television than in films. So far, yeah. I mean, if all we're judging off is, is Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, and I actually like Man of Steel, and I, I don't hate Batman v Superman as much as most people. I have definitely have issues with it. But, well, you're excited with the Ultimate Cut. Well, I'm excited about the Ultimate Cut because more about maybe Superman, more Batman, more you know. So, oh, maybe more of them punching each other in the face. We can hope. We can hope so. That was pretty anticlimactic, though. Well, the Martha thing. Yeah. The Mar the Martha is like a, it's like a punchline, or pretty much as soon as that movie came out, everybody was just like, oh, maybe it's because their moms are Martha. I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. Now anybody like my uh, my. My brother-in-law's mother is named Martha. Yeah, and I everybody's thought that mother's he could, named you know, Martha. He could be, he could Martha, be a DC but... character, too. No. You think Seth is, is a superhero? He could be. He could be. He's always, you know, off saving people with, you know, electricity and all that kind of stuff. Who knows? He could be a superhero. Like Electro? He's a, Maybe. He's, but he's not saving people. He's the bad guy. But you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah, same idea? Yeah, maybe something like that. All right. That's interesting. Anyway, so Cosmos, Popstar, Never Stop, Never Stopping. And The Flash, highly recommended by the Crooked Table podcast. Um, but seriously, watch The Flash. Tweet at me at Crooked Table. Let's talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> and you did say you are enjoying Flash more than you were enjoying Gotham. Yeah, well, I mean, I watch Gotham and I write reviews of it for uh, of the episodes for ScreenRant.com. And I enjoy that all right, but it, it's very much more of a guilty pleasure type of show. Like you watch and you're like, oh, this is fun, whatever. But it's not really, you know, there's... Not not there's not cracks in the storyline. There's just gaping holes in the storytelling on the on that show. Whereas the Flash seems like it 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 has a very clear idea of the story it's trying to tell from the outset. Whereas Gotham, I feel like they're sort of episode by episode being like, oh fuck, now what do we do? <laughs> How do we explain this one? And I feel like they runs in run in circles every other week. Gordon's in trouble with with the law because he did something that he wasn't supposed to, and then every, and then the next week he's back and it's all good. I'm like, what the hell? Right, but they're not. But um, with Flash and um, Legends of Tomorrow and Supergirl, those those all have the same creators, don't they? Yeah, the executive producers and stuff. And Gotham is totally separate. Like Gotham will not be joining the shared universe because Batman's a kid, so they're not really going to do that. If they're introducing the best time travel paradox. Yeah, well, maybe. I mean, I guess I guess anything's possible, but it's unlikely, I would say, because it's on a different network and everything. Um, they're bringing Superman onto Supergirl, and they cast the the guy from Teen Wolf, or one of the guys from Teen Wolf. I don't but not Jason Wolf. Bateman. No, not that Teen Wolf. Or Michael J. Not, Fox. No, not, the, not the movie Teen Wolf, the TV show Teen Wolf. Yeah, that, thank That's you for MTV, clarifying. right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, I think the best we can hope for is that maybe at some point they let Batman show up on Arrow or something like that. I mean, you know, that it's possible. Well, if their cinematic universe isn't really working out very well, they could do what Marvel does. Well, plus it's also TV. plus it's also they have the Flash showing up in the movies as a different actor. So it's like, why can't we just have Batman and Superman show up on TV as different actors? It's like, if you want people to get that they're two separate things, then just make them two separate things. What is this whole thing like? No, we can't have Batman and Superman on television. It's like, why? Who cares? You can do it. You have the technology. 
you know, we we see special effects like crazy on these shows. It's why just why not just have them show up if you don't want to build a show around them for whatever reason. Then okay, I guess, but you know, at least have them show up and exist. You know, acknowledge that they're part of the the world that they're you know that all these characters share. Right. So I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. Anyway, so yes, the Flash. Uh, do we want to jump right into Finding Dory? Sure. So we find we saw Finding Dory actually had a sneak preview, but we weren't unable to get find the time to record this episode until a couple of days after the, it came out. But you know what? That's that's fine because people are still talking about it. It's still just it's had its first weekend and um, sort of planning on, like I said at the top of the show, on getting these episodes out every Wednesday. So this falls right in line with with getting that getting to that pattern. Um, so Finding Dory was a thing. Finding Dory was a thing, and we did find Dory. Um, I mean, I liked, I did like Finding Nemo better than Finding Dora, Dory, which is pretty typical of sequels not being as good as the original. But it wasn't, I actually was worried that Finding Dory was going to be bad. Cars 2. And I, which I never even saw Cars 1. But you saw, Cars. you've seen clips and footage and trailers, and you're like, wow, that looks dumb. Right. Right. And and it is. It is dumb. I didn't even finish Cars 2 because I was like, oh, God, this is terrible. Right. And I don't like that Pixar is now dabbling in sequels. I think that they're a lot more creative of um, a company than that. Unless unless it, it unless what they're making a sequel to, like, if, unless the movie they're making a sequel to naturally lends itself to a sequel. You know what I'm saying? Which is why, I'm, I, which is why Incredibles 2 it makes sense because... You know, it's a family and they're superheroes and they fight crime and it's like the evolution of that family dynamic and such. So that, you know, I think everybody was kind of waiting forever for that to happen. But that hasn't happened yet. What's on the docket? Right. It's unscheduled. But you have Monsters, Inc. and then they did a prequel, Monsters University. Which nobody asked for. I don't know who wanted a prequel of this two in college, but okay. Which you also haven't seen. Right. Exactly. You're not missing anything. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I've made, you know, I've been making you watch all the ones that are worth it. So you're you're safe from the Cars franchise, basically. How come they didn't want to make a Bug's Life too? It wasn't successful enough. That's a shame. It only made like 150 million at the box office, which is not that great. But um, but so, yeah. So wait, we're finding backing up a second. What what was your what are your what were your what's your relationship with Finding Nemo going into Finding Dory? You know, when did you first see that movie, and what what are your thoughts of it overall among Pixar's canon before we jump into Finding Dory? And then I'll answer. I'll, you know, I'll do my side of it. Well, I saw Finding Nemo um, for the first time on DVD soon after it came out, and I thought it was cute. And um, you know, when I had was kind of keeping up to date with Pixar's movies as best I could, and um, I thought it was cute and um, it was a good story. And I did like Finding Dory. I like her positive outlook of. You know, just keep swimming. That's, you know, that's great for children. It's great for adults. It's just a good... Become a meme now. Since yeah, then. it's a good just mantra. One thing I was worried about with Finding Dory, though, is that they were, you know, with what happened with Finding Nemo, where the clown, you know, clownfish started being sold at, um, at pet stores and children were flushing them down the toilet to save them from being in, being in tanks. I was worried that same thing was going to happen with blue tanks. So... I don't know. I don't know the update on that. I know that has nothing as much to do with the actual movie, but that was one of my big concerns that whenever you put a movie out like that, that um, is for children, there's just a lot of excitement over, you know, like it's like watching a movie where there's... 101 Dalmatians. Didn't that have the same right, issue? Yes, exactly. Exactly. It just, it impacts, it impacts animals in real life, which was the exact um, opposite of what the whole point of Finding Nemo and Finding Dory is about you know it's not about you yeah know. that's the funny thing too is it's like one of the one of the few um franchises where people are like oh the fish the animals blah 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 but in the movie you actually watch the movies the the humans are always the villains pretty much in both of the finding nemo and finding right. dory. i mean we'll get to finding dory in a little bit there's a great sequence with that that we'll we'll talk about i guess well it depends how much how spoilery we want to get on that um but yeah go ahead um but just that you know um clownfish make up the great barrier reef and I believe blue tangs do as well. So when they're taken from their habitat, it does affect, you know, the environment. But, um, I mean, I thought Finding Dory was cute. Whoa, was... whoa. Finding Nemo. You're supposed to give Find... me your, your relationship. Oh, Finding... To... <laughs> right. Yeah. You're like jumping... You were you went you went from film critic to animal rights activist there. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> hey. You didn't even address what I said. Okay, so... What did you my... think of Finding Nemo going into Finding Dory? You said I saw it on video and it was cute. But then we rewatched it. 
Not long we did. Ago. We re- yes, we did. Was that, did it. you like it any better then? Did you did it remo- resonate with you more on an emotional well, level? I remember being one thing I kept saying. Has parents and stuff. I remember one thing I kept saying when we were watching it again was that the water looked amazing in Finding Nemo and just and that was you know two thousand three. Yeah. And, you know it's just just the just the way that they were able to do the CGI in two thousand three was amazing, and so of course with Finding New Dory, it was. It was incredible. I mean, the it was they, you know, you take thirteen years of experience, and you know, they blew me away with their animation as I suspected they would. So, what was the other? What was the other question? No, just like did the um, did the story of Finding Nemo resonate with you anymore the second time? Like the 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 heartfelt part with you know this father and the son and that whole thing and um like did you feel for the characters anymore? Were you like, oh look at these fish, they look cool, they swim, and that's nice. I mean, I, I mean, I would say that they, it resonated with me both times I watched it. Okay. I mean, yeah, maybe a little bit more the second time. Well, but, that's, that's, that's what comes with age, too, a lot of times. Right, but I think that it's similar to, you know, the movie Brave. Like, I, a Brave resonated more with me as a female with the relationship between oh, me and my mother. Oh, the father-son thing? Yes. So I, I feel guess. like, I feel like that Finding Nemo kind of, in a way, does that for, for boys and men. You resonate more with your father watching that. Right. It's more of a father-son story. I guess so. So that's... So, of course, you know, it's heartfelt, but I don't think I got the same um, emotion oh, from I it. I cried, like, a couple times, probably, yeah. when I saw... Even as even when I was, you know, when I first saw it in theaters. Um, and I, I've always held Finding Nemo, like, in the upper echelon of Pixar movies. Um, for me, it's Toy Story, Toy Story 3, WALL-E, Incredibles, as I mentioned, and uh, Finding Nemo, like, the, the top five, still. Um, even, you know, after all of this, I still put it in the top five. And, of that. and for you, why is Finding Nemo so, so high up there? Um, I like, uh, I like the adventure aspect of it. It's, it's very, it's sort of like a road trip, but across the ocean and all the different characters that, that he, he and Dory, Marlon and Dory encounter. And of course the father son aspect of it. Um, plus the, you know, the, there's a lot of great laughs. Um, Ellen DeGeneres as Dory has become an iconic character because of that. Um, yeah, and I, and like I mentioned earlier, I like the role that the you, you, the humans play in it, and the way that they proceed, the way that they portray uh, the humans in the story is really clever. Plus the visuals and everything. The visuals are really breathtaking. And Thomas Newman's score, um, which I listened to that day, bef- like the day we were going to see Finding Dory, um, I uh, I really like that a lot too. Um, I don't know. I just it, it's one of those Pixar movies that works on all levels, and it and it hits you right in the feels um, in a way that a lot of the other ones tried but didn't really reach so i guess to transition into finding dory um finding dory was good but i uh, finding nemo for me was five out of five and finding dory was more of a four out of five um you know i enjoyed it a lot and had a lot of the same appeal of the first one but it didn't really hit me emotionally in the same way i don't know why that is maybe it's because i don't have amnesia or whatever well no uh, i think but, i remember we were talking about this when we were leaving the movie theater well, yeah why do you think that is um from what I remember what you're saying and why it didn't really impact you the same way is that you felt like the ending... Well, are we going to get into Not spoilers? yet, not yet, but okay. I'm not going to say the actual ending. The ending happened too quickly. And then it was going back, it kind of... It just went too fast. Yeah, it yeah. It didn't let the emotion set in. Because they just had, like, at that point, they were just like, all right, movie's almost over, let's finish things off. And I was like, right. whoa. And I felt like the movie kind of was ending a couple times and the other problem here one one good thing about finding dory that i did like and then why it's also bad um a lot of it takes place not in the ocean but this isn't spoilers if you've seen any trailers of the movie but in a marine life institute where you know the animals are are different tanks and you know um dory trying to make her way looking for her parents supposedly somewhere there and because of that, it differentiates, it differentiates itself from the first one, and then it's not in the ocean, so it's sort of taking those characters and putting them in a different environment and enc- and opens up the ability for them to encounter different kinds of animals. So, like, the octopus that's also heavily in the marketing and that so many critics have mentioned is a highlight of the movie, which I happen to agree with Ed O'Neill as Hank, the o- octopus. Um, however... The bad part of that is because they're not in the ocean, you have to come up with really over-the-top ridiculous ways for them to get around, like getting carried around by a bird in a bucket and like flip-flopping through things. And it's like all this crazy where they're jumping from tank to tank to tank across, almost like across rooftops and shit. Where the point where I'm like, all right, just 
disbelief suspended, but Jesus, you guys are pushing it, even for an animated movie about fish. Right, yeah, I, that was exactly Because I, I noticed that. It didn't hinder the experience for me, but going back and, like, thinking about it afterwards, like, yeah, that... And that happens a few times. Yeah, it's like so three or four times throughout. It's just so it's convenient like, wait, what? how they get out of these, um, these obstacles... And you know, as a for a kid watching it, they wouldn't pick up on that kind of thing because it's just it's a fun movie and it's funny and all that. But yeah, I don't know. They, the the plausibility was sort of stretched a little bit, um, even for even for this because like it didn't it didn't we even have this conversation? You were saying, well, it's a fantasy. I'm like, well, n- sort of. It's animated, but it's not supposed to be a fantasy. There's supposed to be fish that are like, you know, they're real life fish. They don't fly around. They're not from space or anything. You know what I mean? Toy Story is a fantasy because toys come to life. Bugs Life's not a fantasy. It's about bugs. It's about fish. It's a different thing. That's true. Up is even isn't even really a fantasy. Um, Wally's, you know, Wally is Wally sci-fi, but yeah. So they were they sort of took some of the fantastical elements a little bit too far for me. Um, but it, that, that didn't really detract from it. It was just it's so fast paced for the most part, which makes it fun as a like a thrill ride, but. I feel like the characters don't really have enough time to sort of breathe and have their moments throughout the the movie. And it's a little sh- slow. Early on, I feel like it does take about maybe 20 minutes before things really kick in. Because as it starts, I'm sort of like, oh man, this is this is sort of rough so far. Because, you know, her, them getting transitioning into... Because what's cool in the beginning is that throughout, well, throughout the film, we do see a lot of flashbacks to Th- Dory as a little girl and the things that she heard and how they're connecting in her mind. You mean a little fish? Little, you know, little fish, whatever. When she's a little, little female, little fish. female fish, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so we do then sort of fast forward, like we start off with her and her parents and then we sort of fast forward through her, meet, her meeting Marlon and then, you know, six months later or whatever to, you know, where the story really begins. And then it it's, the movie has sort of an awkward transitional period between Sort of like the Cricket Table podcast, actually. Between, all right, we're picking up exactly which this was the story we told, and then here's the new story. You know what I mean? Where she's like, she accompanies uh, Mr. Ray to the class, and it's, I guess that's mild spoilers, but not really. It's first five minutes of the movie. And then it's sort of like a ham fisted way of the kids being like, well, where do you come from, Dory? And she's like, where do I come from? And then, well, I have parents, they're out there. And it's just, it felt like it was scripted, a little too heavily scripted, uh, just to get, to get the ball rolling. You know what I mean? Right. Well, one thing, and I hope this isn't considered spoilery because this is all, this kind of starts really to flashbacks, but I kept wondering why her parents didn't have amnesia too. Yeah. Did it yeah. only impact Dory? Yeah, I think it's only impacted. She was just born like that. And in that way, in, the, in that way, the character, the character's really, um, you know, able to connect with anybody that feels different. Like, I don't fit in or people look down on me because I'm... You know, I'm different for whatever reason because she has the memory problem. Yeah, which wasn't she fr- clarified but- in Finding Nemo. In Finding Nemo, you just think the blue tangs have a memory loss issue. No, no, I that's never what I, that. That's what I assumed. Oh, I never thought that. That was uh, her specifically. I think she even says, I have a short-term memory problem or whatever in the movie like she does here. Um, but you really delve into, you know, that universe, universal nature of I don't belong, people don't want me around because people in the movie get frustrated with her a lot. And they're like, oh, here comes Dory. Even though she means well, she's frustrating to deal with, which makes sense because she did, to some people, she did become borderline annoying in Finding Nemo, which I can understand. And I even heard it when we came out of the, the review, uh, or not the review, the screening, I even heard one of the film critics there sort of be like, I thought she was going to be annoying in this movie, but, you know, she was actually really held her held her own and developed her as a character. And Finding Dory is really bold in that it jumps, jumps, right, right, jumps, jumps headlong into the fact that that there's a, a lot of tragedy behind this character, and it and it kind of um, explores that in an interesting way. Okay, you look like you want to say oh, something. Oh, no, I'm. No, I agree. I I think that's good to know that she that blue tangs do not have memory loss problems. <laughs> I thought that was particular to the fish, but um, but yeah, you, uh, Dory is is special because she does have a memory loss issue, and and it's nice that Mar- Marlin and Nemo, you know, love her so much, even though she forgets things. I'm glad that she remembered them, though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, gosh, they probably have to like watch her a lot so she doesn't like forget them. But but probably, but she does. She does say short term memory loss, doesn't say long term memory loss. So it sounds like once you know the way it appears. And well, it's and it's funny. Go ahead. I didn't mean to oh, um, just that with she that once you she starts to remember you and you get in her actual long term memory repository, you are now a part of her. Yeah. And um, so, 
Yeah, and there's a podcast called The Next Picture Show, which if you're not subscribed to on iTunes, you should listen to that because it's pretty great. And they're actually about to do a pair of episodes talking about Memento in conjunction with Finding Dory, which I remember I remember when I was listening to their, their previous episode, I was like, and I paused it, and I was like, oh my god, honey, they're, they're going to do this movie, Memento, which I love, which is one of my all-time favorite movies in relation to Finding Dory, which is a freaking brilliant idea, and I'm so excited to listen to that. But it's it's essentially like that. Like she's got he has the same short term memory problem. He remembers who he was, his past, everything up until the incident, and then you know he just to forget the conversation he had two minutes later. He had it after he had it. But then, but then it's not. But it's not really the same it's thing. It's similar though. I mean, it's sort right? Of, but yeah. I was just thinking with like Memento, for example. I mean, we also don't really know what happened at the end of that movie, but but John apparently, if John is claiming that he's been around this whole time. Why has he still not now at this point instilled himself as a long term memory um, character? Yeah, well, in his well life? Oh, that's all. The yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's a whole up to, but, that's a whole different topic. So that's that's a little bit of a subtle difference between yeah, yeah. Dory and well, plus in, with Leonard Shelby and Memento, that it there was a specific incident that led to his injury. I think Dory was just born that way. Yeah. Like she had Lady big Gaga, little eyes. Lady Gaga style. Yeah, she had big yeah. little eyes. Yeah, when she was yeah, a little she's fish. adorable. Little, all the little Dory stuff I thought was really cute. Even if the connections between, you know, what triggered her memories seemed a little... Ham-handed? Yeah, a little bit. I like that word, I guess, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, they were this like... Yeah, it it did feel a little forced in certain points. But, you know, it's fine because... What the the, uh, emotional arc that that character goes through is is worthwhile. And Ellen DeGeneres is so great in that part. Again, surprise, surprise. Not really. Um... But I did like. And she loves that character. Yeah, she's she's. I think she's been the one like, hey, well, let's do a from Dory movie. Like, and she's been one ready to do a sequel for the longest time. And and in hindsight, I think it was a good idea to shift to shift the focus over to her. I mean, especially. I mean, for if only from a marketing standpoint, because this movie made like 135 million dollars this weekend or something. Because Dory is probably right behind Buzz and Woody as far as Pixar's most popular character. We even saw a little boy come into into the screening with a with a Dory stuffed animal. Yeah. Would you say that that's probably the case after Woody and Buzz Lightyear? Oh, yeah. Dory's probably the second most pop, or, or if not if not more popular than Definitely. them. Definitely. If we're talking about Pixar conti- characters. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. In <laughs> yeah. conjunction with them, yeah. Yeah. Which is which is saying a lot considering how big the Toy Story movies are. Right. But what did you think about in the movie all the, uh, all the callbacks to the first movie? Like having uh, Crush and Squirt, the turtles show up briefly and... You know, oh, spoilers, I guess. I think they're in the marketing, they're too. The, they're also in the, yeah, they're in the, the movie, mar- Yeah, too. they're in the marketing. And then there's, you know, the seagulls that show up briefly, flying and go by, and going, mine, mine. <laughs> and then just, like, the Just Keep Swimming thing gets referenced. There's a lot of callbacks to, to make it feel like it's the same universe, uh, you know, set in the same world, which it is, obviously. But did you think that they put too many of them, or did you think, for the most part, they felt pretty natural? I, I It felt pretty natural. Yeah. It didn't, um, I, I agree with you that. You know, it, it's, I mean, sometimes in your own life, you don't, run into that many of the same people again but yeah but they didn't i was surprised that they didn't actually shoehorn more of the original cast who there. was missing do you think well i mean the the people from the tank don't really show up right during the movie um and then i you know the pelican didn't really show up uh, and i feel like the only yeah, characters I are why really the pelican didn't show up well, because he's in australia he's a, that's jeffrey True. rush and then it's, uh, that's over in australia True. so you know, they that that made sense at least that they didn't just have random people there. The people that they that they had come back, which was Mr. Ray and the you know some of Nemo's classmates, which are briefly there. And then I I think they had to kind of put Crush in there somewhere because he's got his own attraction at freaking was that Animal Kingdom or Epcot? It was Epcot. Epcot, yeah. He's got his own attraction at Epcot, and he's probably another one of the bigger one of the more popular characters from Finding Nemo. And I would say Finding Nemo might have also been a big reason that. Tor- maybe tourism spiked in Australia for a few years Probably. because you know it, the whole movie basically. <laughs> All these terrorists there. walking by and be like, "Where's Forty Two Wallaby Way?" <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, but what did you think of the animation in Finding Dory? I thought it was great. I think I think, I think it has developed a lot, um, and some of the things that they pull out, like the just keep, keep going back to the octopus. But the octopus looked almost photorealistic in some points. It was weird. Did you pick up on that? Um, yeah, a little bit. I I was more thinking of the seals. 
The seals, the seals had right, right. a really the sea lions, I guess. Sea, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess. On they're, the rock. Yeah, there's. Is that they're, Idris Elba and then I think yes. Dominus, Dominic, Dominic West. West? Yeah, yeah, they they're, were they were so funny. And I and I remember hearing the main seal's voice. I'm like, that sounds so familiar. And I for some reason I totally blanked that it was Idris Elba. So as soon as I saw, it, I was like, oh my god, of course, because Idris Elba showed up in Jungle Book and Zootopia. So he's like making that Disney money this year. Yeah, he's gonna be their new their new uh, best friend. Basically. But um, I just think the sea lion's fur was just amazing like yeah just how polished it was and photorealistic and gosh they're just their animation just really impresses me and i to go back to this movie i was not a big fan of the good dinosaur but the cgi was incredible i mean that was really incredible animation and they did it again with biting dory with all the water and and all except that. except they may remember to make a good movie this time right. yes exactly. which is important <laughs> but remember good dinosaur is what pushed Finding Dory back. Yeah, yeah. I think... Find, it was a bad I, mistake. Um, I, I guess. I mean, I, I wonder if how this movie would... If this movie would have been more successful if they had re- released it in November. I mean, it already made a lot of money, but I wonder if it would have done even better had it come out like Thanksgiving. Why do you think? Because the holiday weekends are huge. This was just like a random weekend in the summer. Thanksgiving's a huge thing. Everybody on the planet would have been like, all right, we'll have our turkey... Then we'll go see Finding Dory, and then we'll go shopping because the store's open at like seven p.m. now. That's true. Which yeah. is ridiculous. That's a good point. Um, but it also feels, but it feels more like a summery movie because it takes place in sunshine water. and stuff. Yeah, there. sunshine takes I place guess. in water. It's definitely, but it's, I don't know. I maybe maybe it was an insurance policy on the part of Disney, and they're like, just in case that I know this is not going to happen, but just in case, let's let's say for instance, Alice Through the Looking Glass doesn't do well. <laughs> We should probably have some other big summer tent pole to make our so we could push our quarterly earnings up. And you know, now that they did that, I bet they're really glad because, oh man, wow, Alice fell flat like a freaking stone. And you didn't even see that one. No, I heard it. I, I, well, I wasn't the huge. Well, we're going off. To, we're going right. off topic now. We usually, do. but I wasn't a big fan of Alice in Wonderland. I mean, I have it on Blu-ray, but I was that was when I was buying things, just like Tim Burton, whatever. And then I was like, why do I have this? This is not very good. It's not bad. It's not good. It's just kind of, eh, it's like a 2.5, maybe. Maybe 3 if I feel like being generous. But it's not a great movie by any stretch of the imagination. Nor did it deserve to earn over a billion dollars worldwide. But when I, so I was, when I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, jeez. So when I saw the trailer for the sequel, I wasn't really interested. And then when the reviews started coming, I was like, okay, good. I'm good. Maybe if I, maybe on Blu-ray, if I'm feeling bored one day, I'll check it out. But... But yeah, so Finding Dory, it's weird too because this is like their fourth huge movie this year. All of which I happen to think are really, really all strong. You know what I mean? Disney? Find, yeah, Finding Dory. Civil War. Civil War. Zootopia. Oh, yeah. And The Jungle Book. Right. Which are all really solid films and like probably within my top 10 to 15 this year. You don't remember the day that, when, um, that Disney would just come out with a movie a year? Well, that was before they, they acquired everything under the sun. Right. Now they have, you know, I mean, if we're only three of those, three of, it's funny too, because three of those are the, the Walt Disney pictures, and then one of them is subsidiary with Marvel, obviously. Um, oh, Pixar's a subsidiary then, isn't it? Sort of, but it's still Walt Disney. They still put the logo, like, the Walt Disney name on right. it. Right. Um, but yeah, so, I don't know. And I didn't think I was going to like Jungle Book as much. Like, I was like, uh, I'm worried about that. We'll see. But no, it was really good. And, uh, and so was this. So... They're on a roll. I'm looking forward to... I don't even know what's their next big... Oh, the BFG is their next big movie. Uh, and then um, and then after that, Moana? Mo, well, they have Moana. They have Rogue One. They have a lot of stuff that's in the pipeline after this. So, but yeah. So, where where do you put Finding Dory on as far as the 17 Pixar movies that we've seen so it's far? It's hard. Um, I haven't seen as many Pixar movies. Well, it's true. Have. Yeah, you haven't seen maybe what, a handful of them. The crappy ones, basically. You're right, C- right. Cars, Cars Two, Monsters University, and I don't think there's a, any others I'm missing. Yeah, because you've shown me all of them. I guess that's true. Well, Monsters University is not bad. Maybe I should show you that this week. That way, you've seen everything but the Cars franchise. Yeah, don't don't put me through that. No, it's terrible. But, well, the, the second one's terrible. The first one's okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely higher up. Definitely higher up than a good dinosaur. Oh God! Yeah. And it's sorry, Pixar. I love and, you, but not not that was not good. Not your finest work. Um, and I would say I would put it higher than Ratatouille too. Really? Yeah, but yeah. I I don't really know my top five. 
for Pixar. I think they're I, guess, I think they're pretty much I think they're just solid most of the time. The only problem is is now Disney Animated Studios is competing with They're stepping up their game. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean for for me, I would put this this is 4 out of 5 like I said, which from which is pretty much the same score I I give Ratatouille on Letterboxd. Um, letterbox.com where you can rate your movies and stuff if you haven't checked that out that's that's a cool site to, to look into um, but it's probably on like the not the f- top level of the ones I mentioned earlier but like the low second level you know what I mean because I have those top five that I mentioned and then I you, would still say this you is have the fives the 4.5s and the fours this is a four but uh, I would say this this is definitely not as good as inside out that's a 4.5 for me that was nearly perfect um so so what about you would you put Fighty dory or inside out i would put inside out inside okay. out uh, resonate with me more so basically what you're saying is this year between zootopia and that's a fantasy right inside out yes. yeah yeah because it's like this like like it's a, like a theme park inside of your mind that's not how it is um as far as we know uh <laughs> a little the little people in my head are yelling at me right now um so basically this year what you're saying is that disney animation is doing a better job than pixar yes because Utopia was real, probably one of my favorite movies of the year, right? And they've been and I'll pretty get into solid. This next episode about that. Yeah, they've been pretty solid with all of their animated movies. Well, what was before that? Was that Big Hero Six? I, I didn't see which it. You didn't but, see, yeah. And Frozen. then before that was Frozen, Wreck It Ralph, and then before that was Tangled, which was their first and, and, and what the second we were, Renaissance. And what we were talking about with uh, Pixar versus Disney animation is that uh, to me, Pixar is looks. It looks like computer graphics like it the animation is just it's they have the best animators in the world clearly it, it, it just it's really good and then disney animation animation studios it looks more like a three-dimensional cartoon you know three-dimension animation like it looks it looks like the 2d character designs but just then given that extra pop so that they look three-dimensional is what you're saying right, right? exactly yeah because we've talked about this yeah, because if you look at something like Aladdin and then look at the characters in Tangled, you can see that those characters sort of resemble the same style of those characters. Like uh, Flynn, the character from Tangled, looks sort of how I would imagine a three-dimensional version of Aladdin would, like face-wise and everything. Like, right. The way his jawline is and his eyes and all that. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's their style. Especially with the human characters, like the human stories. Like Zootopia is a little harder to to. to tell i guess i guess what would you compare that to something like jungle book or something like robin or hood? um robin hood with the fox what about the i mean bambi well now you're going way back <laughs> yeah i know yeah. i know Jeez. but i'm thinking like they had a rabbit in there well and... i was thinking robin hood because of the fox like yeah. if you look at the fox in robin hood and the fox in zootopia that they're not, not too far off as far as like design work yeah that's true so anyway finding dory another thing you so phrase basically this is this is your assignment listeners you need to start catching up on Cosmos and The Flash. Go out and see Popstar and go out and see Finding Dory and support Pixar because whenever Pixar is at the top of their game, we all win, basically, because, you know, uh, it's kind of a lacking of... I feel like there's kind of a dearth of, like, quality children entertainment out there, as far as, especially as far as animated movies, because other than Pixar uh, in Disney and, you know, the occasional Universal or, or whatever... That actually works. I mean, I like Minions, but nah, I wouldn't say it's a good movie. You know what I mean? Right. Um, you have a lot of that stupid pop culture trying to be hip, but not really wanting to and come up with anything clever. And I'm, I'm looking at you, Angry Birds. Um, so whenever Pixar and Disney drop something like Jungle Book, like Zootopia, like Finding Dory, that actually delivers a story and laughs and a thrill ride and emotions and the whole thing. It's, uh, I think it's always something to be celebrated, um, even if they occasionally fall off the mark with things like The Good Dinosaur. Right. I guess that's our sort of our bottom line. Final. But you know what, though? My two-year-old nephew really liked The Good Dinosaur. It was a perfect movie well, for, yeah, him for him to say because he's a baby. And yeah, he's even like, though oh. some of the moments in there are really, the, like, really the animal, like, bites the, the man, like, little boy, like, bites the head off the bug. You're like, what the, what the fuck is this movie? <laughs> it's There's graphic. some weird shit in there. Like, the, the stoner triceratops and then, like, the cowboy dinosaurs that are like yeehaw while they're running it's like it's that's a strange film i don't know somebody was smoking something over in the pixar office and just like fine whatever we, uh, we already have our our slim dunk in inside out we could just throw this out there and right see what happens. yeah um but and it's you know kids movies don't have to be pandering to kids right and they should be enjoyable yeah, to both adults and children because inside out for example 
was, I think, like very high level concepts that a child wouldn't necessarily understand because there's some of that that they haven't experienced yet and won't for some some time. But yet there was something, obviously there was something there for children, you know, and Pixar definitely, well, there's a they lot always of, have bright colors. I was going to say, there's a lot of colors. There's a lot of like crazy, interesting looking characters and, and fun stuff happening. But then for the parents, there's, there's, you know, the emotional things to connect with. The fact that we were all adolescents. We all went through that confusing time where you're try you're going from being a carefree kid to, to adjusting to be an adult. And, and, uh, you know, the lesson that that movie teaches kids as far as, you can be happy and you can be sad. It's allowed to feel both because they sort of go in tandem because when you realize that the happy moments sometimes are fleeting, it makes you appreciate them more. And that's where the sadness comes into play. And those, those two are emotions aren't mutually exclusive. You can feel both at the same time and they're allowed to coexist. And that's what made that movie so powerful. And Finding Dory doesn't have that level to it. And that's, that's why I'm like, eh, you're not, not up to that level. Right. But it does talk about um, the importance of family that, you know, as you get older, um, as an adult, you realize how important family truly is. And um, so maybe, you know, that part of it, I, I connected to, you know, Dory's trying to find yeah, her yeah. family and find where she belongs because she clearly feels like she's never belonged anywhere. So um, so that kind of thing was the higher level concept for adults to attach themselves to. And then for children, of course, bright colors, all the animals. Funny stuff happening. Yeah, fun accents. All I'm going to say, the touch pool sequence. That's yes, it. people uh, who have seen the movie know what we're talking about. Kai, who you Kai doesn't usually laugh at like random things, like because I, you know, I'm I just told you I'm, I've been obsessed with the pop star soundtrack. So for for her to start bursting into giggles doesn't usually happen, and that happened a lot. Like that whole sequence, you were basically like laughing the whole time, which was really cute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the touch pull sequence is pretty pretty good. So definitely check out. Finding Dory in theaters now. I'm sure you already have because, holy shit, it made a lot of money this weekend. But um, you can find me on Twitter at Crooked Table. You can find me at the Vault Key LLC on Twitter. Of course, go to CrookedTable.com for more podcasts, videos, reviews, and other movie-related goodies. And uh, like I said, I think we'll be coming back, or I'll be coming back next week with another episode. Probably, like I said, just touching base on movies that I haven't talked about. Because I've been seeing a lot of stuff, and without doing the podcast on a regular basis, I haven't really had anywhere to talk about it. So basically, you guys get to listen to me ramble on about movies for a half hour or 40 minutes, however long. Sounds like a good time. I, uh, yeah, it sounds like a good time for me. So if anybody, if people want to download it, far be it for me to, to you know take that away from them. Uh, but this has been the Crooked Tail Podcast, and thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Roll credits. This has been a production of CrookedTable.com. All rights reserved. That's the yard of the little KED.